Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you. An anti-human trafficking operation during Comic-Con led to more than a dozen arrests. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Carroll in for Maya Trabulsi. A task force of regional law enforcement agencies oversaw the investigation. KPBS reporter Katie Anastas says they're calling on the public to help. Authorities say traffickers see large events like Comic-Con as an opportunity. Comic-Con brings over 100,000 visitors to San Diego to participate in those events, of course, most of whom are here to be able to enjoy the sights of San Diego, uh, as well as the activities associated with this uh, convention. However, there are also individuals who come to San Diego uh, who uh, are seeking to engage in commercial sexual activity. An undercover operation led to the arrests of 14 people attempting to purchase sex. 10 potential victims were found and offered services. One is 16 years old. Officials and advocates from the U.S. and Mexico gathered in Chula Vista today to discuss human trafficking. They say they need the public's help to stop it. Since January of 2024, the task force has received 86 leads, which has resulted in 52 victims recovered, 20 of those being juveniles, and 104 arrests. Owen says there are signs of trafficking to watch out for in children. These include running away from home, truancy, chronic absenteeism from school, or a sudden drop in grades, a change in their friend groups or alienation from longtime friends, even rumors among peers about sexual activities or the use of commercial sex terminology, a sudden change in behavior, attitude, or attire. And in both children and adults, Owen says other signs include drug use, weight loss, bruises, and the use of multiple cell phones. Katie Anastas, KPBS News. The largest prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia since the Cold War has officially taken place. Among the prisoners are a number of Americans, including a Wall Street Journal reporter and a former U.S. Marine. Laura Aguirre brings us the latest. They are free. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich and former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan are safely in U.S. care this hour, released as part of the largest prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia since the Cold War. In all seven countries and 24 detainees were involved in the complex exchange. At the White House, Today, President Joe Biden Paul was joined by several members of the hostages' families. Multiple countries helped get this done. They joined a difficult, complex negotiation at my request. So for anyone who questions whether allies matter, they do. They matter. For Whelan, his release ends more than five years in a Russian hard labor colony after being convicted for espionage. Gerskovich was recently sentenced to 16 years in Russia for the same after being held for nearly a year. The State Department had designated all U.S.-related prisoners as wrongfully detained. More than a dozen Russian prisoners were part of the swap, among them a colonel with the Russian Secret Service who was jailed in Germany, the highest-ranking prisoner demanded by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Vadim Krasikov. This is a guy who killed someone in a Berlin park in 2019. He's an operator. This is a murderer. The reality of hostage, if we sat around and waited for equal deals, we'd bring nobody home. This is going to be a legacy piece for President Biden. We stand for freedom, for liberty, for justice, not only for our own people, but for others as well. And that's why all Americans can take pride in what we've achieved today. I'm Laura Aguirre for KPBS News. Well, there are some spotty showers and thunderstorms around in some parts of the area. A little more likely over the high ground, but we've seen some isolated showers and storm chances uh, linger uh, with the current pattern even tonight, even at times, maybe a little closer to the coast. Uh, temps will get down to around 62, Mount Laguna 80 in Borrego Springs. But the heat's going to be building this weekend, and an excessive heat watch is in effect through the weekend for the interior deserts. We'll tell you how high we go in just a bit.
Well, as Jeff was indicating just there, the National Weather Service has issued an extreme heat warning for the desert regions of San Diego and Imperial Counties this weekend. The announcement comes amid another year of record-breaking temperatures in Southern California. KPBS Imperial Valley reporter Corey Suzuki spoke with one heat expert about how to stay safe this weekend. There's been a growing awareness of the dangers of extreme heat in North America. In 2021, a heat dome struck the Pacific Northwest and killed hundreds of people. And the climate crisis means those kinds of events are only becoming more common and more intense. So what does this mean for all of us? And what can we do to stay safe? If you identify yourself as somebody at risk, I would recommend to stay in a cool place, to limit your physical activity as much as possible, and to drink a lot of water. Tariq Benmarnia leads the Climate Epidemiology Lab at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. He says certain people need to be especially careful, like those with diabetes and heart or lung conditions, and pregnant people and young children. If you don't, uh, you don't identify yourself as a vulnerable individual, susceptible individual, uh, just still be careful because heat affects everybody. Benmarnia says some of the key warning signs to watch out for are moist or pale skin, excessive sweating, difficulty breathing, and dizziness or confusion. If you start noticing any of these symptoms, you should try to find a local cooling center or somewhere else with air conditioning. The good news, he says, is that every heat death is preventable. Corey Suzuki, KPBS News. The summer season brought a surge of COVID cases across the United States. The CDC says two variants are responsible for about half of the cases. Wastewater testing puts California as one of just eight states in the very high category for viral activity. And in San Diego County, data shows test positivity rates skyrocketed from about 6% at the beginning of June to more than 19% last week. I think that if you're somebody who's at risk for complications from COVID, like you have diabetes, obesity, heart disease, other things that would put you at risk, then maybe think twice about going to large gatherings or places where you would uh, potentially be in contact with people who would have the disease. Wear a mask, wash your hands, do all the things you know to prevent infection. It's worth noting these numbers are lower than they were during the winter surge and still well below their peak during the height of the pandemic. But doctors say getting a vaccine booster is still important. It's the best way to stay ahead of new strains that emerge. San Diego's first Transgender History Month begins today. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen tells the story of one pillar of San Diego's trans community. As an African-American woman who began transitioning in the 1960s, Tracy Jada O'Brien is a rarity. Few lived publicly then, and fewer survived. She grew up in St. Louis. My childhood was fantastic. The only thing that was lacking was the affirming of my gender, because I felt different from the very beginning of my life. Trans wasn't a word yet. She just felt female. When she would act on it, adults would reprimand her kids would bully her, but she says her higher power always gave her these glimmers of affirmation. At the carnival, there was a traveling carnival called the Royal American Carnival, and they had these side shows. At these side shows, they have these, what they used to call shake dancers, like they'd be uh, scantily clad women or uh, impersonators doing shake dances. And there was, there was this one impersonator, no, there's one person. It wasn't, per, it was, she wasn't really an impersonator, but it, once again, it was that, it was that connection. Her name was Greta Garland. I, I'll never get her name, and I saw me. As a teen, she found a library book on Christine Jorgensen, one of the first people to successfully undergo gender affirmation surgery. Don't ask me how I found it. I found it, and I stole it. And I brought it home. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought it home and put it under my bed. So I knew, oh my God, there's an answer for this. And she shot up to six foot three. You know, I didn't look like the average chick that walked down the street, you know, and when I walked down the street, people laughed at me, you know, and, and, and that happened all my life, you know? And as you see, it hurts to this day. At 19, she moved somewhere that felt freer. San Francisco was like a utopia. It was the early 70s, it was the hippie era, it was the free love era, and it was just so much fun. It was so, so much fun. Fun, but tough. She lived unhoused in the Tenderloin District and became addicted to drugs. What I found there was a place to survive, and what I found there were um, 
people like me that were trying to survive. What I found it was prostitution, what I found was hustlers, what I found was a stage, what I found was a bar. And that's what I was shown. So that's what we did. Few businesses would hire openly trans women then. Sex work was a common way to survive. I came to San Diego in the early 80s because there were sailors down here that would give us money for sex. You know, so we said, let's go to San Diego. She was 31, still unhoused and addicted. She says her trauma immobilized her. In order to survive, you know, we would go in the stores and steal because at some point in time, my looks was not enough to even make $2 because I, I was so deeply in my drug addiction. She says after a dozen petty theft tickets and prostitution charges, she found herself in San Diego jail, Section 2D. That's the Queen's tank. That's where the transgender girls and the effeminate gay boys are housed. A woman there told her about an LGBT recovery center. O'Brien decided to go after her release. And that was the best decision I ever made in my life. I was the longest resident to ever be there. And I needed that time. She started interviewing for caregiving jobs. I had found a tall girl shop and a big foot girl store. So I, I was able to you know, put myself together with the way I would look presentable. And so I was afraid, but I went, you know. It was still a dead end. And they sent me letters that say in no specific terms would we ever entertain the thought of licensing you to take care of people with, with your kind of background. I was devastated. I was devastated. So O'Brien found a place that would employ her an HIV AIDS care home. And some of the girls that I was in jail with came there and I was with them when they passed away. She leaned on her community and bent her arc in a new direction. She says she attended City College, became an alcohol and drug counselor. She modeled for a flyer she developed with an AIDS foundation to reach sex workers, consulted for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to improve policies for trans people and became a caseworker for Family Health Services. What has kept you going for so long without burning out? I had burned out. I did. It's really weird at home. I, I kid around like an old lady. But as soon as I leave the house to get, get to work, I'm up and at it, I'm up and at it. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission, you know. I'm on a mission. I don't want any other trans or non-binary or anyone who's slightly different to ever feel I'll go through what I went through. This month, she'll attend the Democratic National Convention. What do you think your child self would think if they could see you now? Oh, she'd be ecstatic. She'd say, oh, mommy, you did it, girl. <laughs> Katie Heisen, KPBS News. The Federal Reserve says interest rates will hold steady for now, but they've also signaled a cut could be coming soon. Many economists predict a rate cut could come as early as September. Jen Sullivan looks at the indicators policymakers look at to determine whether they should lower rates. You may have noticed the price of many things that you buy have gone up, but those price hikes are cooling. And while it's great news for consumers, it also means the Federal Reserve could soon be lowering interest rates. Current rates are at a 23 year high. People hate inflation and a lot of people uh, in their living memory, haven't had to deal with really strong inflation the way we have in the aftermath of the pandemic. So what does the Federal Reserve look at when determining whether to cut rates? One indicator is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. The Commerce Department measures how much U.S. households are spending on certain goods and services, like car insurance. The way prices change for the things that, that consumers, that households in the United States spend their money on. The latest data released last week shows the PCE index slowed 2.5% in June from a year earlier, which is closer to the 2% inflation goal that the Federal Reserve wants to see before lowering rates. Another indicator the Fed looks at is the Consumer Price Index, which measures the average change in prices for certain goods and services over a period of time. In June, month to month, prices fell for the first time since the start of the pandemic. They also look at unemployment rates. We get weekly data from the government that tracks the number of people that file uh, a claim to receive unemployment insurance. So. That's a really timely and important measure. The good news is most economists predict all these indicators show the Federal Reserve will likely lower rates in the fall. The trend line is unambiguous and the Federal Reserve is going to feel confident enough to start loosening policy at September. For Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan.
Commercial flights are set to take off from Palomar Airport once again. KPBS North County reporter Alexander Wynn has more on what that means for the airport and North County's economy. Soon there will be more departures, more arrivals and reunions at Palomar Airport. American Airlines recently announced it will soon offer daily flights to Phoenix, Arizona from the county-run airport. It means economic activity, uh, increased economic activity for the airport in the region. Jamie Abbott is the county's director of airports. He says the aviation industry supports about 2,600 jobs at Palomar Airport. And it also means giving people the chance to fly out of their community instead of travel to uh, Orange County, uh, John Wayne Airport, or down to San Diego International to, uh, to begin their travels. So it's, it's, I think it's going to be a great benefit for uh, the residents of, of North County. American will offer two outbound flights to Phoenix's Sky Harbor International Airport. The flights will be operated under the American Eagle brand. In a statement, American Airlines says the new service will provide convenient one-stop connections to destinations across the U.S. and Mexico. I estimate that for every time that plane lands, it adds about $300,000 to the overall regional economy. Eric Bruvalt is the CEO of the San Diego North Economic Development Council. He says that Phoenix is an American airline hub, so these new daily flights will be a boon for tourism. So just a few direct flights in and out of Palomar that serve key markets for our tourist industry, like Las Vegas, like the Phoenix area, perhaps the Bay Area. It's just good for driving overall visitor spending in the North County. But first, Palomar will need to update its infrastructure to support commercial flights. Right now, it's pretty simple to go through security screening at Palomar Airport, but with commercial airline returning, so too with the TSA and beefed up security. The last commercial flight out of Palomar was in 2015, and the Transportation Security Administration had removed all of the screening equipment. So we formally had to request um, to bring their equipment back and their personnel back to Palomar uh, in order to provide the screening for the American flights. Currently, JSX and Advanced Airlines offer chartered passenger flights out of Palomar. They operate under a different aviation license and do not require TSA screenings. Flights from American are expected to take off starting February 13th. Alexander Nguyen, KPBS News. Firefighters in Northern California are still working to contain what's now one of the largest wildf wildfires in state history, and it's still growing. The Park Fire has burned more than 393,000 acres. That's just under 4,000 acres away from the top four spot. More than 500 structures have been damaged or destroyed. One family who lost their home in the fire has been through this before. Mana Sadik has their story. When you're a kid and you're like, wow, someday I'm going to own my own house, but it's going to burn down. And then I'll get another one and it's going to burn down again. Like, who would have thunk it? For Christy and Michael Denu, losing their home in the 2018 campfire was something they never thought they'd have to live through. Last week, they found themselves in the same nightmare all over again. Christy recording the moments, she realized she might never see her home again. Once I saw that what the sky looked like, I said, I, we're not coming home. They say it took them seven hours to evacuate, making a trip into town that typically only takes 20 minutes. Their house, along with their neighbors, three homes, all leveled. How do we rebuild our lives again uh, from the ground up? You know, you think you have a house, your grandkids are going to come and enjoy that house with you in the future. And then once again, it's just gone. The insurance crisis spawned in part by the campfire leaves them now at even more of a disadvantage. By the third summer of getting insurance, it was just so unattainable for us and so unaffordable it felt as if we would have had to have a mortgage payment just for our insurance. It's just hard to fathom how you could spend so much money every month to try to save something and then still lose it anyways. The mountainous beauty is what led them to Cohasset in the first place, but it's something they say they'll rethink. I don't think we'll be buying in the mountains again. It's, yeah. I think, it's just a little too scary. Despite everything, they maintain a sense of optimism. <laughs> they say the loss of their home wasn't the biggest thing to happen to them that week. We evacuated and then the following morning, our daughter went into labor. The following day after that, gave birth to our first grandchild. 
when we think back on these dates, maybe it won't be as sad. We'll think about our grandson being born. Hmm. Manasadek with that story. A GoFundMe has been set up to help Christy and Michael. Well, we've been dealing with some heat and uh, we still have uh, some spotty thunderstorms around. There will be a diminishing chance as we step into Friday, but still isolated showers and thunderstorms may occur over the high ground, over the mountains of interior Southern California. Uh, we will turn gradually hotter. Uh, and uh, as the moisture has been a little bit beneficial, nice to see the dew points rise a little bit, which does diminish the fire danger just a smidge. Temperatures will be steamy, and as we get into the weekend, uh, we're actually going to see uh, temperatures rise a bit. There will be some low clouds due to the coast, maybe spotty drizzle for some, but even a thunderstorm, the best chance for an isolated thunderstorm will be over the interior and the high ground. Tomorrow, there's still a chance for an isolated storm or two here into areas around uh, the mountains of interior Southern California. You can see we have an isolated thunderstorm plotted there near Mount Laguna, uh, but it's uh, not as likely near the coastline. In fact, uh, overall, into Saturday. This is beneficial. You can see some of the large fires uh, like the park fire up to the north. Uh, the isolated storms can be kind of a two edged sword. Uh, they can lead to erratic winds that can even actually fan the flames and also cause some unpredictable fire behavior for fire crews. But on the other hand, the dew point increase is nice and that uh, slows fire spread for the most part. On the other side of the coin, we also have isolated thunderstorm chances that could bring uh, stray lightning strikes around the periphery of these storms that can also trigger new fires. So again, a lot of good and bad uh, kind of uh, uh, opposed uh, to one another here with competing factors, whether it's something we should celebrate or not when there are wildfires out there. Isolated storms there uh, into the interior tomorrow, and then we expect to be dry. I don't think we're going to see much around here in the local radar scan for the weekend, but the excessive heat watches will be with us all weekend long here for the interior deserts. It's going to get steamy out there. So for the coast here, we're looking at highs, low 80s. It's warm, but uh, bearably so. A little more humid as well. So the dew points will be up a bit compared to where we have been, despite temperatures surging a bit inland. We're looking at highs around 94 on Saturday, uh, 91 Sunday, but back up to 94 again on Monday. So a little bit of variation with our daily temperatures. Mountains, here we have the isolated storms on Friday. They become less likely this weekend. Uh, and uh, it's going to be really warm, if not downright hot here this weekend as we surge to 113 into the deserts for Saturday and Sunday. And the heat backs off just a smidge into next week. I'm AccuWeather Meteorologist Jeff Cornish for KBBS News. Imagine walking into a house and suddenly things just don't seem right. In fact, it's very disorienting. That's and what's even stranger is that it was built that way on purpose. Ken Kramer takes us inside for a very unusual look around in this story about San Diego. Cute little place in La Jolla, and in the front yard, there is Mary Beebe doing some gardening outside this Cape Cod looking house that's just as sweet as can be, all the little touches of home. But can I just say that there's something very odd about this house? Can you see it's tilted or misaligned or something? Oh yes, my sister won't come in. <laughs> So some people, it affects everybody differently, but it affects everybody to some degree. It is. It's tilted. The floors, the walls, all the furniture, everything is at an angle. From the second you walk in, it's serious vertigo. <laughs> and you know Mary had it built just this way on purpose. The structural engineer first said, when he heard about the idea, he said, that's, that's a pretty preposterous idea. A house that would be deliberately designed to be disorienting, put together in such a way as to play tricks on your mind. Now, when I look at you over here with a door that's a little bit smaller, you look very tall. And if, you, if I stand up here, I look a lot shorter, I'll bet. Well, they said, we can build it. We're pioneers, engineers. We can figure this out. And they did, all for the sake of art. They built it and hoisted it seven stories high where it hangs over the side of the Jacobs School of Engineering building at UCSD and there is nothing else like it anywhere. A lot of people think of the Wizard of Oz and that's very appropriate, you know, it could be arrived here by tornado. In fact, it's called Fallen Star, part of what is the Stewart Collection at UCSD, you see them, about 20 works of very unconventional art 
from Tim Hawkinson's 180-ton bear in the academic courtyard to Bruce Nauman's vices and virtues in flashing neon right outside the window of our little house here. We had a student up here, and the student said, well, we, UCSD doesn't have a football team, and the Stewart Collection's kind of like our football team. And that made my heart just go, wow, you know. Mary is the director of the Stewart Collection. She says this house was inspired by a Korean artist named Do Ho Sa, who came to the U.S. to study design and felt complete disorientation in his new home, like he'd been dropped from the sky. So he sketched out the idea for this house. Mary took it from there. We wanted it to feel comfy and cozy, but a little off-putting. Young kids sometimes want to know, does she live here? She tells them <laughs> no. And honestly, I don't know how anyone could. The only straight up and down in the house is the hanging chandelier, and that looks plum crooked. So here's to Mr. Do Ho so and the late James Stewart De Silva and his foundation and Mary Beebe for such a fascinating artistic creation. Maybe Fallen Star didn't exactly drop from the sky, but we're happy it landed here, for it is something quite unique about San Diego. If you want to see more of Ken's stories about San Diego, and who wouldn't, his half-hour show can be seen tonight here on KPBS at 8 o'clock. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm John Carroll. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following, And by viewers like you, thank you.